السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات ویلکم ٹو ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور برانڈ مینجمنٹ چلتے ہیں الیکشن نمبر دو کی طرف لیکن پیشتر اس کے کہ الیکشن نمبر دو دیا جائے مزید بات چیت پڑھائی جائے میں یہ امید رکھتا ہوں کہ آپ نے الیکشن نمبر ایک جو ہے بڑی توجہ اور بڑے غور کے ساتھ سنا اینڈ اسپیشلی دا ہینڈ آؤٹس وچ وا سینٹ یو دیٹ یو گون تھرو دوز ویری ویری کیئرفلی بیکاز انلیس یو ہیو اے ویری گڈ انڈرسٹینڈنگ آف دا پریویس لیکچر دس نو وے دیٹ یو آر گوئنگ ٹو اپریشیٹ اینڈ انڈرسٹینڈ دا پریزنٹ لیکچر اینڈ ہیونگ سیٹ دیٹ لیٹ می گیو یو اے ری کیپ آف دی پریویس لیکچر وی ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ یو واٹ اے برانڈ از وی ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ واٹ برانڈ مینجمنٹ از اینڈ وی ڈیڈ ڈسکس ان پریٹی مچ ڈیٹیل واٹ از اٹ دیٹ از گیون برانڈ مینجمنٹ so much significance in present day's management. What is it that has brought the concept into a limelight and such a sharp focus more than ever before? We have also talked about this that the brand management is because of the organization structures that have been changed in which way and with that change مینجمنٹ کی سوچ اور افکار جو ہیں ان پہ اس کا کیا اثر ہوا ریمبر وی ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ دی ایڈیشنل لیئرز ان دی آرگنائزیشن اسٹرکچر آف دا مارکیٹنگ ڈپارٹمنٹ ویئر وی ہیو یو نو دا مارکیٹنگ مینیجر دین وی ہیو یو نو پروڈکٹ مینیجرز اینڈ برانڈ مینیجرز رپورٹنگ ٹو ایونچولی دا مارکیٹنگ مینیجر سو ایز لانگ ایز یو ہیو دیٹ انڈرسٹینڈنگ دیٹ فائن ود می وی آلسو ڈسکسڈ دی فنکشنز آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ And while talking about the functions, it became very clear that brands are the lifelines of companies. Brands are the things which really give the reason to stay in the market to companies. Brands are the ones which bring revenue to the company. Companies are all about brands. And when I talk about that, it goes without saying that I'm talking about the FMCGs, fast-moving consumer goods companies. I'm talking about um, industries where you have you know, branded products, could be like electronics, could be cars, could be motorbikes, anything you know, which is branded and uh, which is intended to appear as something very distinct so that consumers can register that in comparison with the, compat- the competitive Uh, products. With that, we are now on the way to understanding the process of brand management. While we were talking about the functions of brand management and uh, related topics, one thing which came to the surface was that brands add value. They add value to the company, they generate value to the consumer. As a matter of fact, I should have talked about consumers first and then about the company. And they also add value to themselves. How they do that, we're going to talk about that later. Lekin baat ye hai ke jab brands value add karte hai, company ki taraf, to zahir hai ke ye add karte hai value through profitability, through earnings and uh, cash flows. Jab ye cheeze positive tarike se companies ke saamne aati hai, to companies ko برانڈس کی جو اہمیت ہے اس کا اور بھی زیادہ احساس ہوتا ہے اور اس کے ساتھ ہی یعنی ساتھ ہی ساتھ برانڈس اپنی ویلیو جنریٹ کرتے ہیں اور وہ جو ویلیو ہے وہ برانڈس کو پاور دیتی ہے واٹ از برانڈ پاور ٹاک اباؤٹ دیٹ سم برانڈس آر مور پاورفل سم آر لیس پاورفل The more powerful brands are the ones which are very well established in the market and the less powerful brands are those which are less established. This is a fact of life which we all know, not only as marketing personnel, but also as consumers. So the value which brands generate for themselves gets translated into what we call brand power. And this is something which came to the surface back in the 1980s. 
just like, like I talked about this uh, development in the last lecture, it was in the 80s, just about 20 years ago, that companies started realizing the power of brands more than before. And the reason they started having that feeling was the markets were getting matured up and the room for further growth was not as large as the manufacturers and producers wanted. Companies were out to buy brands and those which were very well established were becoming stronger and stronger because those companies were investing more and more into those brands to make them more powerful. But the point and fact is that it was in the 80s that this realization took hold. And it was at that time that companies realized that their real power and their real value, meaning the financial value, did not lie in the buildings, plants, the machinery they had or the equipment they had, actual value lay in the minds of the consumers. Why in the minds of the consumers? Because it is the consumers who made decisions about buying certain brands and they bought certain brands more than others. When we talk about the positions in the minds of the consumers, we are talking about another concept which is known as positioning. Positioning is a concept which was propounded by two advertising executives in New York, the United States, again back in the 80s. And what they propounded was that positioning is not something which manufacturers or the companies do to the product. It is something which they do to the brand. And they do to the brand through the consumer mind. How they do that? According to these two executives, Al Rice and Jack Trout, there is a ladder, a zina hai, har consumer ke zihin ke andar, images ka, relating to different products. For example, if you take a good look at one category, maybe cars, you have a ladder of images of different models in your mind. When somebody talks of quality, immediately it strikes a chord into your mind and you think to yourself that this is the brand which I always thought is number one in terms of quality and that really is. If somebody talks about another model in terms of the pricing and of course pricing related to relative quality, you again think of something else. By something else I mean another brand which occupies another position on the same ladder in your mind. So what I'm saying is that the best product has the best position in your mind by way of sitting at the top rung of the ladder and then underneath, underneath and underneath. Suppose a ladder has like 10 rungs. You have 10 different brands sitting there in different position, starting from the top and going right down. So it was in the 1980s that companies realized that the real power of brands lay in the minds of the consumers. It did not lie in the buildings or the equipment or the plants which the companies owned. With that feeling, the companies went out to buy those positions in the minds of the consumers. Now, this is not to say that the brands which are being nurtured and uh, fostered for aggressive growth owned by the companies, meaning which were not acquired from somebody else. Remember the discussion on organic growth versus acquisitions? I'm referring to that. So even those brands which companies owned and they were developing on their own, those were also given due importance, as much importance as was given to those which were acquired. But the point is, in a very competitive and crowded market, the brands which were established and powerful were powerful because of the positioning factor. So the marketing managers worked hard 
and harder and harder in order to consolidate and solidify positions for their brands in the minds of their consumers. When I say their consumers, what I'm talking about is different segments which they were serving with the help of different brands in various categories. Uh, the value which I've just talked about, the value of a brand which was here in the consumer's mind got translated into brand power like I pointed out earlier and brand power gave way to another concept which the marketing people as a matter of fact also financial people and everybody in the company call brand equity. What is brand equity? We definitely are going to talk about that concept in detail later because that is a very, very important facet of brand management. It has become a part of the balance sheets, not in case of every company, but in case of so many different companies. What are the mechanics to work out the brand equity in financial terms in real hard numbers? It's not the topic of discussion at the moment, but the point is brand value gets translated into brand equity and brand equity sits comfortably in the balance sheet. The more powerful is the brand, the higher the brand equity and it is the brand equity after which everybody runs. So what I'm saying is that brands vary in value and power and hence brand equity. Why? Her brand jo hai, uski ek different position hai. And all brands vary in terms of their value and power, meaning in terms of their market leadership. One brand is a leader, other is a follower. And yet another is a follower's follower or leader's follower. And same holds true for different categories. Talking about the brand equity, brand value and brand power, there are certain numbers and certain findings which have been put together by the world's largest company on business databases. This company is based in England and it is known as Profit Impact of Market Strategy. The abbreviation of this is PIMS. The basic job of PIMS is to collect data on different products belonging to different companies in the light of the impact of the marketing strategies those companies have in place to achieve goals in relation to their brands. We have a pricing strategy, we have a packaging strategy, we have a promotion strategy, advertising strategy. All strategies support one particular brand and what is the impact of all those strategies on a particular brand is the job which this organization does. It is a very reliable organization and somebody by the name of Peter Doyle back in 1989 put together some very interesting figures which tell us the not only the value and power of brands but also the important role or the significance of the differential between the power and value of different brands. Egg brand market ka leader hai, dousa usse piche hai. Egg brand ka market share misal ke taur pe 40 feesad hai, dousa ka misal ke taur pe 10 feesad hai. Differential is about, not about, rather exactly 30 percentage points. So if there is that much of a difference, what is the impact of the marketing strategy or the respective marketing strategies of those two brands on them or on profitability? Let us take a look at those interesting numbers or those interesting findings. Mr. Doyle says that brands with a market share of 40% generate three times as much return on investment as another brand that has only 10% of the market share. This is what I talked about earlier. If there is a difference of like 30 percentage points, what is the impact of their strategies 
on these two brands. The impact is that the one with the higher share of the market gives the company a return which is three times bigger than its competitor, which enjoys just about 10% in the market. I think it is world of a difference, quite a gulf between the two brands. And the reason he has put together these findings, because these findings reflect actual situations in the market. And these findings relate to the UK market. We're not naming brands, but the findings are factual. The question is, why it happens that way? Why is it that the brand with 30% share of the market is so far ahead of its competitor, who is just about 10%? The reason is that the brand with 30% share of the market, I'm sorry, 40%, the brand with 40% share of the market is in a position to enjoy economies of scale in terms of all the variables of marketing mix. Let me give you an example, and let us talk about Pakistan. A brand hai Charles Fee Sadwala. Misal ke taur pe, Charles mein se 20% share jo hai, wo Karachi market se generate karta hai. 10% ya 12% ke kareeb Lahore ki market se generate karta hai. 7-8% Islamabad or Abul Pindi se karta hai. Aur baaki mulk ki, so major markets hain, like Peshawar, Quetta for example, Hyderabad, wahan se wo generate karta hai. Uske baraks, dousa brand jo hai, number two hai market mein, lekin differential itna zyada hai, aur uska market share sirf 10% hai. Ab us 10% ko bhi haasil karna ke baaste, kaafi strong possibility hai, that this company has to go to many more markets than the brand, which is 40% of the market, just in order to generate 10%. दूसरे लफ्सों में ये ब्रांड जो है ये पांच छह मार्केट्स में नहीं बल्कि हो सकता है उनको 50 या 60 मार्केट्स में काम करना हो सिर्फ 10% शेयर ऑफ द मार्केट जनरेट करने के वास्ते व्हाट हैपेंस व्हेन कंपनीज रन इनटू दैट काइंड ऑफ अ सिचुएशन दे इनकर मोर कॉस्ट दे एंड अप स्पेंडिंग मोर दे एंड अप इन्वेस्टिंग मोर एग्जांपल they have to have a bigger sales force, a, a widely dispersed sales force that has to work in so many different markets in comparison to the company which is operating in just about five or six markets. And let me say that I'm talking about a hypothetical situation. This is not exactly what happens all the time, but this also could be a real life example. The company with 10% share of the market ends up incurring more cost on the supply chain. Think of logistics, the number of vans and the number of trucks they need to have in order to, in order to reach different markets, the operating cost of those trucks and vans, so on and so forth. Look at advertising or total communication as an integrated effort. The same amount of advertising carried out by the company with 40% market share brings them what they have, meaning 40%, and can solidify that even further. And the same amount of money, or maybe more amount of money, brings the other company not 40%, but rather 10%. And there also is a possibility that this company ends up spending more on communications because they are in a situation which frustrates them, which keeps them under a lot of internal pressure and also external pressures on the market in order to grow more. Because when you have your volume dispersed among so many distributors and wholesalers, the amount of activity per head wholesalers, distributors and retailers is not as great as it is in terms of another brand which is stronger. So the trade members are not as happy and they're not as loyal to your company as they are to the one which is stronger. I think these are enough examples to understand 
what I'm talking about in relation to value and power. Let me give you another finding by Mr. Doyle. UK grocery brands, the number one brand generates over six times the return on sales of the number two brand. What I'm saying is that number two brand makes six times less as compared to number one brand in terms of its return on sales. And you know what that is. If your sales are like in you know, 100 units, park rupees, and your net earnings are like in you know, 10 rupees, so the ratio of net earnings to sales is 10%. Simple arithmetic, and I think you know that. So again, you see that we're talking about a tremendous gulf and the impact of that gulf on two different brands. And this again happens because of the facts which I have talked earlier. I could add to those a few more examples, but I leave that to your imagination. The issue here is the impact of strategies on brands, thereby generating higher value for brands so that they become more valuable and more powerful. More valuable for the consumers and more valuable for the companies. And if a brand, remember, we shall talk about this later also, but if a brand is valuable for the consumer as well as for the company, it automatically means that it is valuable for itself, meaning it has generated quite a lot of value for itself. Let us take a look at another finding put together by Mr. Doyle. And this relates the U.S. market. And this relates consumer goods categories. The number one brand in the United States market earned 20% return, while the number two brand earned around 5%. And the interesting part of the whole thing is that the rest of the brands lost money. I think this becomes easy to comprehend if you go back to the example which I gave you earlier. If a brand is strong in so many different markets, it has the potential to achieve economies of scale on every front, on every facet of the marketing mix. I did talk about communications, meaning you know, advertising, promotion, talked about packaging, so on and so forth. Let's take the example of packaging. If a brand is twice as big as the number two brand, I think the number one brand is going to have quite a lot of advantage in terms of buying its inventories in terms of packaging material. Number two brand just cannot buy at that competitive price because the suppliers are going to be happier or are going to be happy with the number one brand and not the number two. Let us take a look at another finding. Small brands can be profitable also. Now, whatever I've said so far, it never meant that small brands always run into loss situations. No, small brands can be profitable and they can also be very strong if they deal with a niche market. You must have studied this concept in the basic marketing course. If you create a niche to yourself, meaning find a niche in the market, define that segment very carefully and you are very apt at uh, identifying the exact needs of that concept and end up creating a real differentiated product with some very distinct features, you can price that product higher. Example, designer clothing or maybe a sports car, maybe a perfume with some very distinct features like the lasting power, like the 
attractiveness in terms of the fragrance. The examples can go on, on and on. So it doesn't mean what I'm saying is that it always is the big brands which are strong in the marketplace. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it depends on the situation and we have different situations for different brands. If your brand happens to be the one of those brands that deal with you know, huge categories in which you have to have huge volumes, then you have to go for very high market share. Because when you are dealing in a very big category, the competition is enormous and the enormity of the competition dictates that you price the brand very carefully, meaning very competitively. And when you have a competitive pricing, it means that profitability on that brand of yours is not very high. There are only two ways to make money. Either you go for big volumes or you go for low volumes but higher price. And higher price you just cannot dictate as a company manager. It is a function of the marketplace. You only can influence that function through the variables of marketing mix. And that is why I talked about large brands versus small brands. Further explanation to the concept is that a small brand does not really have to be very big in terms of volumes because it is dealing only in a small niche in which the total market size or the population or the universe as you have learned is not all that big. So you can afford to go for a higher price and then get into the profitability zone and the brand will be spun into the winner's circle, which will make your company a winner and the brand a winning proposition. When the brand is a winning proposition, it automatically means it is providing the consumers with a very unique value proposition. And let me say here, it's a statement that brand management is all about creating and delivering that value proposition to your consumers. So much for the brand value and brand power. I do hope that you all understand in absolute clarity what brand value is and what brand power is. And our understanding of these two things in relation to the background which I've been talking about since the last lecture, we can easily move on to understanding what brand management process is. But before we talk about that, we still have to talk about a little more in detail, brand equity. What is brand equity? Just like in business, owner's equity is the holding of the owner in that business. And a holding of the owner is defined by the difference between assets of the company, meaning what the company owns in terms of assets, and what the company owes in liabilities. The difference between these two is the owner's equity. And we all know from our basic accounting course that the liability side consists of two basic components, meaning liabilities and owner's equity. And these two put together have to equal the assets on the other side. So, equity of the owner, once understood clearly, can make things easy for us to comprehend what brand equity is. Just like I explained owner's equity, brand equity also is the difference between brand assets and brand liabilities. The larger is the ratio of brand assets to brand liabilities, 
the larger is the equity of the brand. How we assign numbers to brand assets and brand liabilities is not a topic of discussion at the moment. But our understanding of uh, the concept of owner's equity in owner's business can easily lead us to have a clear comprehension of the concept of brand equity, which again is a function of brand assets and brand liabilities. The larger the ratio of brand assets to brand liabilities, the larger the equity and vice versa. What are brand assets? Brand assets are brand quality, brand relevance, a concept we shall talk about later, brand reputation, uh, loyalty, which is um, one of the most important features and one of the most important uh, values which brand creates to itself and uh, for the company as well. These are the brand assets, just to name a few. And what are the brand liabilities? Brand liabilities are the costs which you incur, the investments that you make, could be you know, some uh, you know, questionable practices on part of uh, the, the, the marketing management of the company, uh, some costs, which, which means if a brand is, is successful and it, it is very valuable, it is very powerful, it will have less liabilities and uh, the more assets. So the greater is the ratio of assets to liabilities, the larger is the equity. Let's take a look at the graphical presentation of for the concept. Here you see that we have two bars and uh, I talked about the concept of company assets versus company liabilities. I think you know, company assets are very well clear from the green bar which says it is the value of assets owned by the company. And the other bar, which is um, which, which consists of two components, uh, company liabilities and owner's equity. Liabilities are the money owed by the company. Okay. Now, just imagine this portion of the bar going down, meaning the company having less liabilities, automatically the, the owner's equity will increase. The bar will not increase. It will stay the same because it has to be equal to the asset side. However, the owner's equity will change, change for the better. And same is the case with the brand equity. Let us now take a look at that graphical presentation. Brand assets, again the green bar, that's the performance that adds value to the brand. And if a brand is performing well, it is creating value, it is powerful, and it is creating equity. Taking a look at the brand liabilities, we can see liabilities consist of the performance that lowers brand value. And what lowers brand value is the factors that I just talked about earlier. But the point is, the lower the total liabilities, the larger the brand equity. If you take a look at the equation at the bottom of the presentation, it says brand equity equals brand assets minus brand liabilities. So this is the concept to see which you have to keep in mind and everything will fall in place into a proper perspective and you will not lose the perspective. Having talked about all these things, we are now all set to define brand management. We have done such a lot of talking about what a brand is, what brand management is, why it has become so important, what are the functions, and all those factors of value and power and equity in order to understand what is or what should be the definition of brand management. Let us take a look at uh, the definition of brand management. Brand management is the process of naming products, turning products into brands and managing brands to fully attain maximum brand equity and a brand's full profit potential. I will now break this definition into five different steps because I have talked about those five steps in the definition. If you take a good look at the definition, you will find that out. 
And I'm going to talk about those steps one by one, explaining what every step is, so that we have a very clear understanding of brand management. What is a name and how we name a product? Let me tell you, there are no hard and fast rules in naming a product. You can go for any name, but then there's a method to this madness, if I may say so. One of the approaches which companies generally follow is that they go by the positioning. And I already have talked about the concept of positioning, which is that companies do something with the mind of the consumer and not with the product itself. And they do that with the help of communication. They try to build up a certain character and personality of the brand in a very distinct way that it ends up occupying the position which the company intends to occupy in the consumer mind. That's very important. So that's one of the ways. Like, for example, if you have come up with a product which you think is very high quality product, and high quality is because of, uh, you know, high technology, you, you are going to talk about that uh, the factor of high technology. And you will be talking about that in a way that it becomes very interesting and it is received very receptively by the consumer and it automatically generates that position and preferably position number one in the mind of the consumer. So that's one of the ways that companies uh, choose to uh, go for naming a brand. Naming a brand could also be a company name. It could be a standalone brand name. And it could also be an existing well-established brand name owned by the company. All have the merits and, you know, demerits also. But uh, depending on the situation, this provides any brand manager with a very good guideline to opt for the right approach. You go for the company name when the company has very good reputation and the company name is very well known in the marketplace. If the brand is also named after the company, it catches on rapidly. I mean, there's a high probability. I'm not saying it definitely will catch on 100%, but the probability is very high. People are familiar with the company. It has a reputation. It has a franchise and people are using that name day in, day out. So it is one of the practical approaches. Another approach is to go for a stand-alone brand name. This is a concept which was very popular in the yesteryears, and many of the multinationals with whom you are familiar, I'm not naming them, used to have and they still have these standalone names which represent different brands in um, different uh, product category. For example, if a company is dealing in detergents, it has you know, two or three different brand names. If the same, co same company is dealing in cold drinks, it has you know, got one, two or three different brand names, so on and so forth. But just imagine the complexity and sophistication that you require in order to carry out brand management for all those different brands. Different product managers, different brand managers, and different communications. That's where the catch is. Different integrated communication, meaning different advertising campaigns, different promotions, because you're not dealing with a different entity altogether. It is a different character, different personality. Jab shaksiyat aur kirdar hi badal jai, to zahir hai ki aapko effort jo hai, wo bilkul ek nai sire se karni hogi. If you are using the same name, I mean, an, ex an existing established brand name, which is option number three of the statement which I made earlier, then I think things become rather easy for you. If not easy, say less difficult, because you're dealing with a brand name which is known in the marketplace, and it is the brand name of a product, a branded product. And that is why that you see nowadays the more and more extensions or more and more variations of similar products or even products with very different features across the categories having the same brand name. Dear students, there is yet another way of choosing a brand name. It is said that you can name a brand keeping in view its future 
and destiny at the time of its birth. What does that mean? It is no astronomy. It is plain brand management. And uh, what it means is, you've got to be very clear about the vision of the brand. The vision that the brand management and the company as a whole has for the brand. What does that mean? That means whether you would like to see that brand as a regional brand or a national brand, or maybe you would like to see that brand as an international brand. You might start exporting it, you see, if you have the power to do that. If you are a multinational, for example, or even if you are not one, but you are powerful enough to be able to export, you've got to be very clear about that, that uh, we are going to one day export this brand to international markets. Therefore, we've got to take that future uh, day into account and name the brand accordingly. So this is what I meant by future and destiny. Uh, this is part of the destination planning, and this is part of the overall company vision, which translates into the brand vision. And we're going to talk about that in detail later, but this certainly is one of the options that you can uh, name your brand. Now, after having talked so much about uh, what, are the, what are the possible approaches to name a brand, uh, we shall get on to the next step, which is about um, uh, giving meaning to the brand. Uh, giving meaning to the brand is that after you have chosen the name for the brand, uh, what really becomes of very high significance is the fact that you've got to be very consistent as a brand manager in giving the product its meaning. If you're working hard and are consistent in implementing the brand strategy, the chances are you will, up, you will end up in giving the brand its meaning. A brand presents itself in its differentiated forms. And if you as brand manager are successful in communicating that differentiation or in making that differentiation significantly noticeable in the marketplace through whatever means at your disposal, what you've done is you have created a position in the mind of the consumer. But once you've done that, you have bought that position or you've earned that position. And having had that position, you only have to sustain it and you have to maintain it. Or what I'm saying is you have given the meaning to the product and thereby turned the product into a brand. After you've done that, what is the next step as per the definition? The next step is that you manage brands. How do you manage brands? The foremost fundamental of managing the brand is that management of the department and the company has got to be committed in sustaining the brand, in growing it. And again, you see, when I talk about the growth factor, we have to talk about these strategies, which I just indicated, and which is going to be a topic of discussion in, in, in later lectures, uh, the management has got to stay the course in terms of implementing all the technical details uh, when it comes to following a certain uh, strategy. Because you are following a certain destination plan, a, a, a road map, and if the management is committed in doing so, the management has done a good job uh, of managing the brand. Uh, there, of course, are so many different components as to how uh, to manage a brand. And uh, the fact is that the whole course is all about that. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the whole concept, you know, chapter by chapter, uh, tool by tool, uh, concept by concept, step by step, uh, in order to have a very good understanding of uh, the brand management process. But this is, uh, for the time being, just an overview so that you can uh, form um, a, a formative understanding of uh, the, what is coming later. Management can also support the brand to have it managed better. And by management, I mean management across the company, top management, middle management. Whenever companies have to make decisions on branding or something else, there always are conflicting and opposing views. 
It is the job of the marketing manager, the marketing department, including the brand manager, to see to it that all those conflicting views and oppositions uh, get convinced in favor of the marketing department so that they can seek total support, total, un total support from uh, the, the management of the company across all functional boundaries. Uh, to give you examples of okay, what kind of conflicts uh, can uh, come up while uh, discussing the destiny and the fate and uh, the, the implementation of plans relating brands, it can happen that the marketing department wants to invest in the advertising and in a very different campaign, जबके फाइनेंस वाले जो हैं वो ये कहें कि हम तो तैयारी कर रहे हैं आप ही के प्लान का जो दूसरा हिस्सा है एक नया प्लांट लगाने के लिए या मौजूदा प्लांट जो है उसकी उसमें तौसी के बास्ते या उसमें मजीद इम्प्रूवमेंट्स के बास्ते they might be, you see, a conflicting view from that point of view. And uh, whatever they say, they may also have a very uh, logical uh, background and uh, the logical grounds uh, on, on which uh, they, they give their views. Uh, at the same time, the uh, marketing, uh, the management also has uh, their viewpoint. Uh, all uh, the points of view are very logical and uh, very sensible. Uh, but then the point is, what is uh, it in which it prevail uh, over the others? It is the job of the marketing department and um, the total management of that, that department to make sure um, that whatever decision is taken by the company gets taken in favor of the brand without any compromise. So that uh, everything, get, everything gets translated into the high brand value and uh, brand power and uh, high brand equity. The next step is generating profits. I think it goes without saying that a well-managed brand is destined to bring the company profits. A well-managed brand, in other words, is an assurance of profits. And only profits will lead the company into a better competitive position, allowing it a better competitive strength so that it can make further moves to reach the destination as envisioned by the marketing management and the company as a whole. It is very important towards generation of profits. Profits make a brand powerful. This is something which we keep talking again and again and the reason is uh, we are talking about this again and again because of the significance which this facet of brand management carries with it. Power gives the brand value, which is translated into financial value and hence equity. So in other words, what I'm talking about is that every step of the process of brand management gets translated into value, power, and equity. And unless there is consistency among all these steps of the process, the process cannot move ahead in a well-oiled way. And like I say, while you're going through the process, you have to keep your gears well-oiled and in place. Having said all that, I would now like to give you a recap of uh, the lecture. We have talked about the brand value, brand power, different factors which create value for the brand and in turn the brand creates value for the company and for the consumer. What gives brand power and how value gets translated into power and how power gets translated into brand equity and what is the importance of equity that we have talked uh, with all those factors. Now, what is it that we have to remember? It is not that we have to develop our understanding regarding what is happening in the marketplace. We have basically to develop our understanding from the standpoint of learning all these factors so that when we are working as brand managers, 
that we know how to uh, lay our hands on different concepts that we are learning today. So, I would suggest that while you go through the recorded lectures, do not forget to go through the handouts. They are of immense value. And uh, after you've gone through uh, both of them, meaning the lectures and the handouts, you're going to come up with uh, some very interesting questions. And uh, while you ask questions, don't shy away from asking any questions which you might think could be a silly question. No question is a silly question. The silliest question is the one which you never ask. And for the learning process, it is very important.